right. So we are starting our new social studies magazine titled Exploring the Americas. And I've asked our in-person students to take a look at the front cover of the magazine and kind of think about what this magazine will be about, who is on the front cover. Does any, would anyone like to raise their hand and give a guess as to who is on the front cover here? I asked you to raise your hand. Layla. George Washington, okay. What else do we think? Guys, seriously? Allison. Marco Polo. Are there any other guesses that we have? Mackenzie. The British. The okay. Um, Eosius. Okay, Italian people. Yes, Michael. Travelers. Travelers. Philip. Explorers, awesome. Any other guesses that we have? Frankie. Okay, like immigrants? Yeah, immigrants, okay. Allison? Oh yeah, hello horses, okay. All right, so I will tell you that a, a couple of your answers were correct. So this in fact is Marco Polo, he was an explorer. He was from Spain, though, not Italy or Britain. Um, and technically, because Marco Polo did not, um, I mean, I, I suppose you could call him an immigrant to the places he visited because he wasn't born there. He kind of immigrated there. Um, so you guys are right. This is These are a bunch of explorers. And so we have Marco Polo here and the people that he um, traveled with when he was going on his expeditions to explore the world. Um, let's go on to the next page, you guys. The next two pages, I should say. <clears throat> All right, so on the next page, we have this big map. And we're going to talk about what this map is. Because does this look like any map we see now? Not really. Not really. Yep. So let's read where it says the backstory. Follow along with me. How much would you risk for your country? European explorers were willing to risk everything. They didn't have a lot of information. The journey was always dangerous. They could get lost. Storms could wreck their ships. The crew could get sick. Still, their desire to reach the far off regions of the world was unstoppable. They wanted wealth, fame, and adventure. They were also looking to bring glory to their country and themselves. Their journeys were often paid for or, or sponsored by monarchs seeking new trade routes, more natural resources, and new territory around the world. Many Europeans also wanted to spread Christianity. They saw it as their sacred duty. For these reasons, explorer after explorer set sail from the mid-15th to the mid-16th centuries. This was the beginning of the Age of Discovery, a time that changed the course of human history forever. So oftentimes throughout history, they'll call something the age of something. And so during the 15th and 16th century, since so many people were going around the world and exploring and trying to, to discover things, they named this the age of discovery. Max. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, definitely. How many of you think this is a map, like an early on map before they knew everything we knew? How many of you think that? Okay. Well, let's read that caption first. So, trade and travel over hundreds of years have provided Europeans with some information about the rest of the world. However, much of what they knew was limited by geography and based on stories or rumors. They could not yet cross large oceans. So they knew nothing of the continents that lay on the other side of the world. So yeah, I mean, if we look here, we can see we have Africa kind of down here. Let me screw it up there for you. Right here, Africa, and then Asia. But do we see like North and South America on here? No, because had, had they discovered that yet? No, they hadn't. So this is a map of just what they knew. So if you think about it, let, let me bring up a... Let's see, um, Europe, oops, Europe and Asia map. 
Because if we look to see Europe and Asia, let's see, what's this one? Eh, that's not really a good one. Oh, okay, here. Open image new tab right here. Okay, so like if we look at this map, um, you can see that we have, okay, Africa's down here and Europe is up here, right? So they could like, they could access it on land, right? Yeah. Because they're connected. However, North and South America are not connected to Europe, are they? Yeah. No, so they had not discovered it yet. Okay, so down below, here we can read the think piece too. It says trade with Asia was important to Europe's economy. Europeans cooked with pepper, cinnamon, ginger, cloves, and other spices from Asia. How do you think they reacted when they could no longer get these spices? So imagine like, for example, for Thanksgiving, do a lot of you eat like pumpkin pie? So in pumpkin pie, you use cinnamon, ginger, cloves, allspice, um, nutmeg, those kinds of spices. Imagine not being able to get it around Thanksgiving time. They're, it's all gone. How would that make you feel? It's kind of sad, right? Do you think that hindered some traditions they had for like cooking? Probably, yeah. If they weren't able to get those spices, they weren't able to make recipes the way they knew how to make them. Do you think that encouraged them to maybe make them a different way? Yeah, maybe. Okay, let's look at the next page. So the Silk Road. The Silk Road was a collection of trade routes that linked the markets of China and India with those of the Middle East and Europe. Goods changed hands many times along the route from one merchant to another. In 1453, however, the Ottoman Empire stopped all trade with the West. That cut off European access to the routes. Without a land route, Europeans looked to the sea. So whenever you hear the Silk Road, it's not just one road, and they didn't only trade silk. It was a collection of routes over land, and they traded lots of different things, but silk was one of the main products. Um, so once the Ottoman Empire said, no, we're not letting you trade here anymore, then the Europeans had to come up with a different way of trading or a different place to trade, and then they started looking to sea routes instead of routes over land. Jack L. Uh, it's, it's, so cool it's made from silkworms, which turn into moths. Mm -hmm. But you're right, it comes from an insect. Um, so if we look to the right, it says, one of the most famous travelers of the Silk Road was the Italian merchant Marco Polo. Oh yeah, so sorry, Marco Polo was Italian. I said he was from Spain. I'm sorry, he, was, he is Italian. I think I was thinking of Christopher Columbus. Uh, Marco Polo is Italian, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, the records of Polo's travels became a bestseller across Europe in an age before the printing press. Polo's descriptions of, guys, why is it always such an issue during social studies? Frankie, sit in your chair, please. All right. So Polo's descriptions of the lands and riches and incredible wonders in the Far East captured the imaginations of many Europeans. Some explorers set sail with copies of Polo's book on board their ships. So Marco Polo went and explored certain places before any other explorers had. So future explorers would actually use his book kind of as a guide on their own adventures. Now, do you guys know what the printing press is? The printing press was the first invention that allowed people to make a book without having to write it by hand. Kind of like a typewriter. What it is, is kind of like a collection of stamps and you can move the stamps around to form the words you wanted in a book. And instead of someone having to sit there and write it over and over and over to make multiple copies, they just stamp the words onto the page. Now, it said that his, um, where is it? His book became a bestseller, which means a lot of people wanted it. So they needed to make more copies. I want you guys to imagine your job being creating copies of books before a printing press, meaning you sat at work all day copying words over and over and over again to create multiple books because 
there was nothing that could copy it for you. You had to write it by hand. And I want you to imagine the fact that during this time, you want to know what the most popular book in the world was? The Bible. I want you to imagine your job being handwriting a copy of the Bible over and over and over again. You, they probably memorized it, but was that easy? No. Do you think the people who bought these books had to wait a long time before they got their copy? Yes. yes. So, was the invention of the printing press probably a really good invention at this time? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Down below. Conflicts. Conflicts between Christians and Muslims erupted during the Middle Ages. Backed by the Catholic Church, Christian monarchs waged the Crusades in the Middle East to drive Muslims out of Jerusalem. Muslim invaders conquered territory in Europe, including much of the Iberian Peninsula, which is now Spain and Portugal. Muslim people were driven out of the Iberian Peninsula during the Reconquista, a movement to make all of Spain Catholic. Because of these conflicts, Muslim rulers began restricting European access to trade routes in North Africa and the Middle East. So the reason why these trade routes, you guys, were becoming restricted were because different religions were fighting. That's why, you know, Christians could only use these trade routes and Muslims could only use these trade routes because there was so much conflict between the two groups at this time. Then if we look to the um, next, or to the next one, it says, Henry the Navigator was a Portuguese prince. He wanted a direct source of trade in ivory and gold. He didn't want to have to rely on trade routes controlled by Muslim leaders and others. He sponsored voyages to explore the African coast of the Atlantic. Later, King John II of Portugal set explorers or sent explorers to find sea routes to India. He wanted two routes, one through the Mediterranean and Red Seas and one around the African continent. Now, had anyone explored around the African continent before? No. no. So do you think this may have set up someone discovering the Americas? Yeah. Maybe, maybe. And if we look at that picture, we can see a picture of Henry the Navigator. What does it look like he has in his hand, you guys? A map. What do you think he's doing in this picture? Maybe drawing one? What else? Based on the caption we just read, what might he be doing? Jack L? He might be showing the routes that he wants them to discover, right? Mm -hmm. Saying, well, you know, my map only goes to here, but I want to find a way around this. How can we go around this and avoid the conflict? Remember some of those trade routes were under conflict and they couldn't use them? Mm -hmm. How can we avoid these all together? Can we just go around by sea? Jack L. I think they didn't have, uh, they didn't have a lot of transportation back there because mm -hmm. uh, like, they didn't have the horses thing, they just didn't cover Exactly. You were limited. So yeah, in like the drier areas, you had camels. Otherwise, you had horses. Maybe you had like some sort of carriage if you were rich enough to be pulled by horses. But otherwise, the only other form of transportation was to walk or by sea in a boat. Eosius. Yes, that's the tusk of elephants. Yep. And so, like, nowadays, um, we really don't make anything with ivory anymore because um, during this, this time period and lots of time periods, ivory was seen as a very valuable um, commodity or um, resource, and a lot of people would make things with it. But what that led to was poaching or people killing elephants just for the tusk leaving the entire elephant, but killing the elephant and ripping off his tusks, and that's it. Yeah, not even using it for food, not even using it for clothing, not like, they didn't respect it the way that the Native Americans in our last magazine did. So ivory was seen as a very important commodity during this time, so that's why when we hear about it, usually if you were rich, you had things in ivory, but because of that kind of association with ivory, it led to problems later on in history with people killing elephants just for their tusks. And that's why they're endangered now. And that's why, uh, 
I think there's just something about things mm -hmm. just the way some are not in Africa, but mm -hmm. it's around somewhere else, yeah. and then move to Africa because we don't know where the locals are at. Yeah, there, I, I believe elephants used to be found in other places. We think of mainly Africa, but because of poaching, yeah, they weren't surviving in those other places. Will? Yes, go ahead. Um, so, I think, let's see, we're going to read one more set of pages, so four and five, and then we'll be done with social studies for today. Jack P., do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. In our other magazine, they used all parts of the animal, but when people were hunting for ivory, they were just taking the tusks and leaving the rest of the animal. Emmy. Yeah, quite a few elephants are in danger. They're on the endangered species list. Mm -hmm. And rhinos. And rhinos. Yeah, because rhinos also have ivory in their in their horn. Yes. Yes, we're going to go to the next page. Okay. So, page four, the technology. The right tools can make any job easier. In fact, without the right tools, some jobs might not be possible at all. For a long time, lengthy sea expeditions or voyages were simply not worth the effort. As technology improved, crews became able to sail farther and farther from shore. Navigation, or the science of planning and following a route, became more reliable. Thanks to these advances, European explorers were able to set foot on continents they hadn't even known existed. All right, so let's look at that first one. We just talked about this. In Germany, during the mid-1400s, Johannes Gutenberg invented the printing press. Until then, anything written had been copied by hand. Suddenly, knowledge and ideas could be spread more easily. Early explorers wrote about their journeys. They wrote about what they found and the hardships they faced. The printing press allowed their stories to be shared across Europe. These accounts inspired other explorers to set sail and monarchs to sponsor them. So if you guys, if you look at that picture, it's kind of like one big stamp. So they would arrange the letters to form the words and they'd stamp it down with ink onto the paper, which saved so much time because like we talked about before that, people were writing it all down by hand. Mm -hmm. And then gunpowder. This was a huge invention. Gunpowder learned from the Chinese and steel and steel gave Europeans military strength. They were able to overcome just about any resistance they met in their travels. Explorers had cannons and early firearms. Swords and armor made with Spanish steel were another advantage. The people they conquered in America, for example, often used weapons made of bronze, stone, or wood. And then next to that, we have the, I think it's the Astrolab, lab, Astrolab, was used for hundreds of years. This handheld device helped with many types of calculations. It helped tell explorers at sea where they were. It could tell them their latitude or position in relation to the equator. It could measure the angle of the sun at noon or of other well-known stars at night. Would you guys know how to use this? No. No. Because, yeah, maybe like a compass. Because... Has technology evolved since then? Yeah. yeah. But for a while, this was considered like the best technology out there, which is why it was used for hundreds of years. Because for hundreds of years, they couldn't they couldn't um, develop anything better because this this worked so well for so many years. And then we have the compass on page. What page is that? Five. Yes, page five. The compass. The compass is a tool we still use today. First developed as a navigational tool in China and Europe in the 12th century, a magnetic compass has a needle that reacts to the magnetic pull of the Earth's poles. A compass tells a user where north is. Once you know where north is, you know the other directions. How many of you have used the compass before? Okay. How many of you have used the compass on like your phone or your parents' phone before? Yeah, we have compasses on our phones. Mm-hmm. All right. Oh, and then next to that, we have the, La the Latin sail. The Latin sail was one of the most important developments of sailing. Previously, European ships had to use, had used square sails, which could only trap wind coming from one direction. Could you imagine being on a boat and having to wait for the wind 
to blow in a certain direction for you to move? No, we no, not today. But could you imagine being in a big ship and having to wait for the wind to blow a certain direction? That would stink, right? Well, this limited a ship's mobility. The lateen sail was triangular, so it could take wind from either side of the ship. Used on the Portuguese caravels, these sails made the ships faster and more maneuverable, meaning they could turn them easier if they needed to. And then we have the sextant and its predecessor, the octant. They measured latitude more reliably than the astrolabe does. The first modern sextant was produced in 1759. It is made with an arc of one-sixth of a circle. Degrees are measured along that arc. Navigators could read the angle of the sun, the moon, or a star using the sextant. Then they'd read, then they'd, oh yeah, then they'd read published tables to find the latitude. So the sextant and then after that the octant was like the, um, the technology that eventually overtook the astrolab because we talked about how that astrolab hundreds of years they used it because they couldn't come up with anything better but when they did that's when they developed the sextant and then after that the octant all right and then we have the chronometer it was the first tool that let sailors measure longitude do you guys know what latitude and longitude are longitude is sideways yeah, so if you think of a map, latitude is going left to right, longitude is going up and down. So up until the chronometer, they could only measure latitude or left to right, okay? And so you had to be a really skilled sailor to only be able to navigate based on latitude without longitude. Then enters the chronometer. Put simply, a chronometer is a timekeeping tool, a clock that works at sea. Because of the Earth's regular rotation, time can be used to measure longitude. But back then, clocks didn't work on boats because of temperature changes in motion. The Longitude Act of 1714 promised rewards for anyone who could find a reliable way to measure longitude. So basically, in 1714, they said, okay, we need everyone to be trying to invent this. If you can come up with an invention that allows us to measure longitude, we will reward you. So they just kind of unleashed that to see what people could come up with. Between 1735 and 1762, cabinet maker John Harrison, so he was a cabinet maker, um, he built four chronometers. He eventually won the 20,000 euro prize, which would be about $3.5 million in today's money. Mm -hmm. So back then, 20,000 euros is equivalent to what $3.5 million would be today. But think about, would you, as a sailor or a navigator, you wanted this, right? Yeah. So think about how many they sold. Oh, yeah. Tons. Yeah. So, and it's kind of pretty, isn't it? If you look at it, it it's pretty. <laughs> Not that it matters, but it's interesting to see all the different work that they put into it. It's very intricately, intricately made, isn't it? Yep, you're right. So let's look at that think piece real quick. What technology do you use today to find your way? How would the journeys of early explorers have been different if they'd had the technology you use? I want you to turn and talk to the people around you about that. <laughs> question what technology do you use today to find your way raise your hand if you have an answer to that what technology do you use today to find your way Richie? 
Okay. Tell me just Siri? one. One. Google Siri? Maps. Okay, Google Maps. Okay. I've used Google Maps too. What else can we use to find our way today? Emmy. Ready? Yeah. GPS. Okay. GPS. Global positioning right. Sur service. service. It's service. Addie. Oh, I use my dad's phone. Okay. Phones. Will. Google Earth, okay. Mackenzie. A compass, definitely. Chanel? Waze. Oh, Waze. Yeah. Waze, yep. Michael? Oh, compass on your iPhone. Compass on your iPhone. Allison? It does. Pretty much every car. Well, unless you have like a classic car. But they show you the direction you're currently driving, I like north, south, I east, west. My Zoe. My grandmother. Your grandmother. How many of you know someone in your family who just always seems to know what direction you're going? They have the best sense of direction. My dad had the best sense of direction. We'd be like walking down a trail and we'd go, he'll, he'd say, oh, we're heading southeast. We need to go a little further west. He'd be like, what? I mean, it's not like he was looking at a compass or anything, but he just had that sense of direction. Okay, so then those are some things we use to find our way today, right? Now, our second question was, how would the journeys of early explorers have been different if they'd had the technology we use? What do you think would have happened if Marco Polo whipped out an iPhone before he went on his journey? What would have happened? All right, wait, I want to call on you. Voice is up. Max? So actually, Marco Polo needs Wi-Fi. Hypothetically. Yep. Okay. Answer my question, Max. Hypothetically, what would have happened? How many of you think they would have found all these new lands a lot quicker than they did? Okay, I see lots of hands. What else do we think would have happened? I'm waiting for voices to be off. Your virtual learners are probably getting pretty peeved at you right now, fifth grade. They are listening to everything you're saying. What else probably would have happened? Allison? Oh, what if everyone had an iPhone? Then would what Marco Polo did, would that have been as like famous or no. big? No. What else? Zoe? Everyone. If you just pulled out an iPhone, everyone would just like all turn eyes to him like he just pulled out like a brick and gold and be like, you're right. They wouldn't know what it is. They yeah. Like, yeah. What else? Addie? Oh, so there are three the the inventions that they really have like the the inventions that they have right now, they will be like, Dang it, why did I do that? We yeah. already have something. Yeah, we already have something like that. Yep. That yep. Will Well, yeah, if you think about if technology at that point had advanced to the point of the iPhone, imagine where we would be today. Max, I cannot hear the person I called on fifth grade. Jack L. Max. Oh yeah, we we've, we've reached this point. There's nothing more we need to do. Mm. Sure, but I think we could agree that they would have found it sooner, found different places sooner. Would it necessarily then have been the explorers we know today? If there were iPhones and stuff, would they have still been the first people to discover these places? Maybe not, because if that technology was available, then anyone could have just decided, hey, I'm just going to, I'm in my boat. We're just going to sail this way and follow my map of my iPhone. Will? Um, for Android, so, like, if you were, anybody could pretty much be famous photographer because with the phone, you pretty much just take a picture. You're right. <laughs> no, I mean, you're right. You're right. All right, if you can hear me clap once. If you can hear me clap twice. We haven't gone into this yet. 
But I did want to let you know that if you remember for our last magazine, I had a question we were thinking about as we went through it. You know, yeah. what resources did Native Americans use and how did where they live influence the resources they use? Mm -hmm. For this magazine, we're going to be thinking about this question. What aims or reasons did the European explorers have for journey, journeying to the New World and what challenges did they face? So we're going to be exploring and thinking about why do they want to journey to the New World and then what challenges did they face in those journeys? And we haven't really gotten to any of them at this point. Do you have a question, Jacko? Well, I was just saying, when they find a new land, yeah. you can see that they are very excited. Yep, they are very excited. Well, it would be like us discovering a new planet and being able to travel to it. It, oh, yeah. it. You know, if you think about it, it would be like that. So it was a big deal for them. I know. So our technology is is still evolving and we are still finding new territory if you will even though it's not on our planet mm -hmm. yeah all right last few mackenzie the reason why they're actually uh trying to build something on mars is because they think that the world will end and they need somewhere to take that but also they yeah it's kind of like a backup plan right but also they believe certain planets could sustain life eventually. So yeah, they're exploring those possibilities. Will? Um, um, this is kind of what the Jack L said, but if, if they like find new land, they could just take us down. Yeah, we don't know. Right. Um, All right, I have one more person to call on. I have one more person to call on. You're wasting your own time right now. Next. Um, so this is question, yeah. What, um, I know you did. I could tell. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah. Um, actually, talking about that you guys about did, did that question did Christopher Columbus really discover America no. we're gonna be discuss we're gonna be discussing that don't you worry we're gonna get into that quite a bit all right last two for sure Emmy Talking more about the acquisition of territories. Oh. <laughs> well, do you have another question about? No. No. Okay. Okay. Jack. Well, okay. We're gonna talk about it. Don't you worry. I like that. I like that point. All right. So. 